Thank you guys so much. Bob, Dan, and Ed, we need to come up with a name. Kind of a, you know, Men in Black, Men in Black, sure. The Oak Ridge Boys, kind of, uh, maybe we could call you the Thunderbird Boys in black. Well, I'll move that in just a second. I need to pray, and I would like to invite you to pray with me and to continue to pray for me. Can we do that today? Can we do that right now? I'm going to bow my head right now. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord. God in heaven, it is such a joy and privilege to sing, to talk together, to study and fellowship, to hear and see our children participate in the children's story and picking up offering, to have this time, Father, as a people of faith to come together. We thank you for the gift of the Sabbath. We thank you for the gift of your church and the organization that we are part of, Father. We come to honor you. We come to hear from you, Lord, and to grow, to be forgiven of our sins once more, and to find out about more of the things you want to do in our life. So, Father, uh, continue to be with us, Lord, as we go into this next part of our worship. I, I do uh, agree with my brother who uh, prayed for me earlier that you would anoint my, my lips and this, this would be your time, Father, that you would shine forth, that your word would be heard and cherished in this place. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I'm just going to move a few things here. And uh, I want to say I appreciated all the music today. And, you know, the Lord always has his way of even when we don't always, you know, communicate about a theme uh, regarding our, our uh, you know, presentations and our music. Um, it's amazing how sometimes things just work out that way. And so a lot of the music that you guys selected and sang today, as I was just singing with you and, and learning some of the songs that I wasn't familiar with, I just marveled at uh, how I felt like they just really tied in with what I was going to share today. And the, the Holy Spirit does that, doesn't he? he uh, he's in control, and it's his service. I apologize for doing this. I guess I could have organized this earlier, but I do have a purpose and a point for, for wanting this to be a little more open. Not only do I need a lot of room to move around, because I tend to do that a little bit, but um, because I, I want the center here to be open. So I'm not going to look super organized, but I uh, wanted to do that anyways. Well, I'm in this series of, of presentations and sermons I call Faith Matters and uh, uh, talked about how the doctrine of creation and, and what that means last week. I was able to touch on a few things there. And this week, um, the topic I've chosen is the cross, the cross. And uh, as, as with any topic, you can never address every element in, in a substantial way, in an exhaustive way. So as I pray about what I, I'm going to share and as I ask the Lord what he would want us to hear, I always uh, trust and believe that he is guiding so that that which is um, able to be presented is what we need to hear when we come together to worship. And uh, I pray it's a blessing to you. Um, I do have my little interactive time this morning uh, with the kids quiz. So if you want to just raise your hand for me, I'd love to have you participate. And we're going to talk about things, issues related to water. And there were a lot of water references in the, in the songs about he's with us in the water and talking about peace in the storm and, and things like that. So that's one of the areas that I saw. Question number one, what body of water did God split so Israel could walk on dry land? And I saw your hand go up before I'd even started. So I've forgotten your name. Can you just tell me your name? London, thank you. Go ahead. What did you say? The Red Sea. Yes, yes. There is another answer in this one, though. All right. And Ryden, I, I think I saw, I'm trying to be fair. I think I saw Ryden's hand go up. And the Jordan River. We sometimes forget that there were two bodies of water that Israel had crossed and God, in a miraculous way, split the water so that they could walk on dry land. So, um, uh, there's always kind of a trick in these. I would have been a terrible teacher. <laughs> Who walked on water with Jesus? Okay, what, what is your name? Dylan? 
All right, the D in Jedi, right? Dylan. He, he can say it, say it a little bit louder. I heard it very well that time. He got it right. He said Simon Peter, and that is right. I was going to be a little tricky and call him Simon Barjona, just so that they were all Simons and the Peter wouldn't stand out, just to see if, if people remembered that there were other ways that Simon was known. He was also called Simon Barjona. And again, when you think of his name being the son of Jonah, and him having the likeness of Jonah, and the experience of him on the water like Jonah was, I think that's also very interesting. And we're going to move on here. Oh, oh yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Good idea. Intelligent. I like that. Who prayed that it would not rain? Okay, Jonathan put his hand up over here. We're going to let Jonathan have a, a chance here. I'm sure he'll get it wrong, so others will have a chance. Jonathan. Uh, B, Elijah. Oh, oh, you good guess. You got it in the first guess. I'm just playing with you, Jonathan. No, that's right. That's right. That's right. And it's not so much that Elijah prayed. When you read in 1 Kings 17, it just kind of, he just kind of declares. But as a prophet, obviously he had a, a relationship with God and he tells Ahab, it's not going to rain um, uh, until I say so. And so he was able to have that interaction with God. And that's pretty impressive. You think about people who interacted with God and were able to even affect the natural elements around them. Uh, that's, that's always been a fascination uh, to me in the Bible stories as well. Number four, where was Jesus when he turned water into wine? All right, I saw your hand back here. And I apologize, I don't remember all the kids' names. Jaden, that's right, oh, that's right, Jaden, I should have known that one. Jaden. D, a wedding? You're correct. It was at a wedding, and a beautiful story of Jesus, uh, really before he'd come out and do his public ministry, going to a wedding and uh, interacting with his mother and providing that wonderful miracle. It's considered his first miracle, the miracle at Cana, takes place at a wedding, and there's a lot of beautiful reality and symbolism to that. One more question as part of our quiz, true or false, 50-50, you love these, right? Even if you're not sure, got a 50% chance. I, I have a, a, a funny story about this. When I was in high school, I almost always got the true or false questions that I had to guess wrong. Almost always. I had a buddy of mine, he would even laugh about it because for whatever reason, I just always got these wrong. Waterfalls are never mentioned in the Bible, true or false. I actually saw Jacob's hand. Jacob, glad to have you here today. Waterfalls are never mentioned in the Bible. Is the pink mic working? Say it again, Jacob. False. Oh, there we heard it. Uh, that is correct. <laughs> I had to think about it for a second because one of those reverse negatives, waterfalls are never but false. That is right. It's false. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. All right. There is one. And Toby, that was my last one. So appreciate that very much. You can just give the mic to Tony back there if you want. Um, Thank you for, for participating, for our young people. Um, thinking about all these stories with water in the Bible, they're a lot of fun. And it does kind of lead me into where I'm going with the message today, and I hope you'll kind of follow along here. There's one place that I'm aware of in the Bible where it talks about waterfalls, and I actually want to uh, uh, mention that uh, because I think it's very interesting, and I think it um, goes in the direction of where I want to share with you this message today. Um, here's where it is. Psalms 42, 7. One of, the, one of my favorite Psalms is Psalms 42 in general. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls and all your breakers and waves have rolled over me now i realize i'm giving you just that verse you don't read the preceding you can open it up in your bibles it's not, not meant to be secret you can look at the preceding and, and uh, verse after but this is what uh the psalm writer uh says here he says deep calls unto deep at the sound of your waterfalls and in the previous verse he mentions mount hermon and so mount hermon is in the north of israel it's actually on the border of lebanon and syria um, but it was part of the uh, area that Israel had been a part of. Mount Hermon is known for having heavy snowfall uh, uh, in the winter. And then in the spring, during the spring melt, uh, that, and at a very rapid pace, the, the water would melt off of Mount Hermon. And you could be miles away in the Golan Heights. And even today, you can hear the crashing and thundering of the spring melt from Mount Hermon coming, coming cascading down into the deep pools of the rivers below. And it'll echo 
through the canyons. It was something that, that the, the, the it, people of that area were very well familiar with. And so this reference would, would call to mind this natural phenomenon that happened in that area. And here the psalm writer uses the, the, the uh, element of, of waterfalls and he uses this phrase, deep calls unto deep, or in the King James, unto deep. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls and all your breakers and waves roll over me. Now, a lot of... Uh, 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 commentators and scholars and stuff, it's very interesting. They translate this or they interpret this passage as kind of a negative. They say what the psalm writer is talking about is uh, being lost in despair and having, uh, you know, just the waves of, of trials and transgressions crashing over you. I think that's a completely inappropriate interpretation. I like how Richard Foster uh, in Celebration of Discipline talks about what really what the psalm writer is talking about here. He's using the element of a waterfall to talk about how the depths of God's heart cry out to the depths of our heart to call us to deeper relationship. As a matter of fact, Ellen White will use this phrase, deep calling unto deep, in Acts of the Apostles when she talks about the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos hearing the voice of Jesus, that it was as though the deep was calling unto the deep, come in deeper with me that I might reveal to you greater truths that you need to know about. Deep calling unto deep. Now, why I, this is uh, important to me, why, why this is of interest to me, and why I'm starting the message with this element and this idea is that the subject of the cross is not for the superficial. The subject of the cross, the doctrine, the reality, the teaching, the meaning of the cross is the depths of God's heart crying to the depths of our very souls. We need to remember that. We need to think about that. That this is not just like any other teaching. This is not just like any other reality. Not that one truth is more important than the other or that, they, that we put them in juxtaposition or anything like that. But when we come to the subject of the cross, friends, when we come to the reality of the meaning of the cross, it is deeper than anything we can ever measure. And it requires a sincere and it requires an authentic desire to go deep with God when we come to the subject of the cross. I have been to Niagara Falls um, in 2008 while I was at the seminary. Um, I was working in Detroit for my field school, and so we had a little break, and so we loaded up the family in the minivan, and we drove across uh, the, the Canadian route to go over to Niagara, and I'd, I'd never been to Niagara Falls. How many of you have been to Niagara Falls? Oh, a good number of you. Very good. Wonderful. I, I love the natural wonders. I, I love to be able to visit and see great things. I've talked about the sequoias before in sermons. And, and uh, of course, we've got the Grand Canyon here. So many tremendous things. And God teaches us lessons through these uh, natural wonders. I, I, I remember going to Niagara Falls, and I, it was an exciting time uh, for me and for our family to go to see this wonderful uh, uh, piece of creation and of nature miles before you get to the actual falls miles before you can start to hear the falls and it starts out as just kind of a a, 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 a subtle rumble almost like thunder in the air right just very very often almost like a trumpet blast but just very subtle and then of course as you get closer the rumble and the thunder gets a little louder as you get just a maybe a mile or so away you can begin to smell the water in the air of the churning of the cauldron of the water you can smell uh, that there's more moisture in the air than we not it's different than rain by the way I, I at least for me I felt that it was different but then when you get about a mile and again forgive me I don't remember having an actual distance I'm just estimating I feel like when I was about a mile from even being able to see or get near to the falls, then you begin to feel it. You know what I'm talking about? You guys who've been there, you know what I mean? And, and you're, you know that it's coming, you're prepared for it, but you begin to feel that deep throb, that drumming. And for me, it started in my chest. You know, you can just feel that drumming of, of that, that plunging of the water and the power of all that that's happening at Niagara Falls. Um, and you can start to feel it. Um, I love this aerial photo. Uh, Photograph. There's actually multiple falls. This is the Horseshoe Falls. Then you have the American Falls and Bridal Veil over here. And there's many excursions you can do um, uh, that they build into the tourist experience there. We didn't do them all. Um, this is one where you can go right to the base of the falls. Um, it's 150 or 160 feet drop. Uh, again, it's, it's just an incredible experience to be there 
one of the things you can do is you can go right up to the base of the falls and they have tunnels that you can go to and you can see the water coming down. Here's my point. Here's my point. I had read about Niagara Falls. I'd seen videos, seen lots of pictures, but nothing compares with drawing close to the reality. Are you with me? You can read about it. You can see pictures about it. You can have documentaries shown to you about it, but nothing compares to the reality of drawing close to the powerful natural wonder of a massive waterfall like Niagara Falls. The same is true about the cross. You can read about it, and you can think about it and see pictures about it, and you can hear sermons about it, but nothing will come close to the experience that you can have when you draw close to Jesus Christ at the foot of the cross. Now, obviously, the cross is not a geographic location that we can just go visit. I'm talking about a deep emotional and intellectual and spiritual experience when you open up your heart to God and say, God, I've read about this cross, and I've heard about the cross, and I heard it in Sabbath school. The preacher talked about it in church. I've seen the pictures on the wall. If you leave the cross there, it's going to have a very limited experience on you. But when you draw close to the reality of the cross, that's when its real power becomes effectual in your life. Ellen White said, It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation. Now remember, a large part of the the impetus of this sermon series is not just to be committed to what we believe, but to think about what we believe, reflect about why we believe and what we believe is so important, all right, to contemplate our faith. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day, not each week, friends, each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene. Now, I believe Ellen White would not be too upset with me if I was to say, let the sanctified imagination, okay? Let the Holy Spirit guide the imagination. Is that, is that okay? I think, I think she'd be okay with that little qualifier there. Let the Holy Spirit guide your imagination to grasp each scene, especially the closing ones, which draws us near to the cross, right? A thoughtful hour each day. As we thus dwell upon dwell upon, not just read about it and pass it over, all right? Not just fill in some, some blanks on a, uh, on a Sabbath school sheet, but as we dwell upon His great sacrifice for us, notice this, our confidence in Him will be more constant. I don't know about you guys, I could use more confidence these days. Will war break out in Europe? Maybe. What will be the next phase of the pandemic? I don't know. Will there be uh, work stoppages and another truck convoy and uh, other things to protest how things are going? Could be. Will the Rams win the Super Bowl? Maybe. You know you're thinking about it. Come away with me, though. Let's come away. Friends, I could use more confidence. And I think most of you could as well. We find that as we contemplate the cross. Our confidence in Him will be more constant. constant. Our love will be more quickened. Does this world need more love, friends? Does the church need more love? Do we need more love? Does my family, do I need more love? Our love will be quickened. And we shall be more deeply imbued with His Spirit. Now, just those reasons alone, friends, isn't that enough to take her seriously? It would be well if we would spend a thoughtful hour contemplation of the life of Christ, taking each scene, let the imagination grasp it, especially the closing ones. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross, at the foot of the cross. There's so many elements of our faith that the cross touches touches upon. Every element of our faith 
the cross touches upon. But my message to you today is uh, on, on a more simpler level. It's not enough just to believe. It's not enough just to know. We need to live our lives in contemplation and reflection of the reality of what the cross is. It is the ultimate meaning of our faith. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, and 1 Corinthians becomes a, a very important book in, in, in comparing it with Romans especially, but here he says in 1 Corinthians, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I have a very distinct memory um, when I was 16 years old, I was in a little town of Moses Lake, Washington. Moses Lake is kind of halfway between where I grew up in Yakima and the east side of Spokane. You have this little town of Moses Lake. And I, I was um, uh, in, in, a, in another church uh, denomination at that time, but I was very active in church. And we went to Moses Lake to do evangelism. We, or, we got a bunch of uh, other smaller youth groups together. Again, I was only 16. I was not the leader of this. I was just a, a participant. But we wanted to do evangelism in the uh, town of Moses Lake. So we actually hired a Christian band by the, by the name of The Cry. Any of you ever heard of The Cry? K-R-Y? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you must be mostly Adventists here. I didn't realize. Um, they're called The Cry. Very popular. They wrote Cassie. So, so after um, Columbine, uh, Columbine, you know, that terrible thing, um, the, one of the girls that was killed, her favorite band was The Cry. So The Cry wrote Cassie's song. Um, and that was one of the things that kind of got them uh, a little bit more well-known. They're from Canada. We're missing the point here. we got to get back to the message. Is that okay? So we hired the cry. And so they come to the, the amphitheater there in Moses Lake. And we invite the community. We spend a week sending out, you know, going around handing out flyers. Come come hear the cry. Come hear about Christ. And, and, and our job as youth was to kind of mingle with the crowd. And um, um, I remember... Uh, a distinct memory. We were to go around talking with, well, what brought you to the concert today? Oh, really? Have you ever thought about Jesus? And have you given your life to Jesus in a kind of very Billy Graham oriented uh, style of evangelism? Jeffrey, you know what I'm talking about here. We're, we're together on this. But we were working together trying to find people who might be interested in Jesus Christ. And um, I distinctly remember there were a couple of young ladies, um, probably about my age, maybe just a hair younger, 14, 15 years old, and so me and a friend went up and said, hey, thanks for coming to the concert. We'd like to uh, see what you think about it. And, you know, we're Christians. We're trying to tell people about Jesus. Um, what do you think about Jesus? And I'll never forget. Now, I, I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up reading the Bible, giving my heart to Jesus. I was kind of a leader uh, among my group there. Uh, we had to pay money to do this. This wasn't a vacation. We had to pay for the expenses of do, doing this little trip. So I felt that I was a fairly competent Christian. I thought I kind of had a handle on things, Vince. I, I thought I, was, I knew where I was going. But in this moment, the Lord had a lesson for me to learn. So uh, uh, these young ladies, I said, well, what do you think? Have you ever thought about Jesus? Have you given your heart to Jesus? And one of the girls, very authentic, by the way, not snarky, not trying to be sarcastic or anything. She said, well, there's one thing I've never gotten about Jesus. Well, wow, what's that? Why did he die on the cross? Now, that's the type of question you, you would think you would be hoping for. Well, let me tell you, it's so wonderful. It's because of this and sin, and he wants to forgive you, and it's because of this. But at that moment, my mind went completely blank, and I felt completely unequipped to answer that question. And I, I, I stumbled out something from my mouth. It was something like, well, it's because, you know, uh, because we're sinners, and he died for us. And, and again, very authentic, she said, um, so that's always bothered me. So you mean that I'm so bad that I needed to die? And I, again, Kim, forgive me, I was just a young person. I, I didn't have all the tools in my, my toolkit at the time. I said, uh -huh. Okay, and God is so good that he killed his son instead of me. This is what she said. And I went, uh-huh. And she said, I don't get it. I don't get it. And I just... Uh, again, I just said, oh, well, you know, there's more to it. You've got to think of the context. And you, you, again, you, you replay in your mind the kinds of things you could have, should have, would have said. But I remember leaving that conversation feeling incredibly embarrassed that as a Christian representative, I felt unequipped to answer or to address what I felt was an authentic question about the reality of the death of Jesus Christ. But this verse says the word of the cross, it is foolishness to those who don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. 
But to those of us who are being saved, it makes all the sense. It's the power of God. Now, again, we could go into all of the analogies of, of the, 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 you know, sin is a cancer and, and God is the, uh, you know, he provides the sacrifice for us. And, and those are good things to do. And those are good tools to have. But what I want to do is uh, look at this in a broader context. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. There is something, and I've talked about this before in church, I love that the Bible is filled with paradoxes. Paradoxes. These are things that there's two seemingly inconsistent things that are true at the same time. It's not about compromise, all right, and it's not about gray areas, all right. It's things like the Bible says if you want to be first, then you got to be, you've heard that before. That's a paradox. How do I be first? If you want to live, then you got to die. If you want to be rich, you got to be uh, poor. Right? If you want to be wise, you, wise, you got to be a, a fool for Jesus Christ. There's just a, there's a dozen or more of these direct paradoxes, but the cross presents us with the most profound and significant uh, kind of paradox we could ever imagine in our faith walk. And uh, just a couple of things. At the cross, you have the total humiliation of the Savior. The weakness of God is there. He's totally naked. He's totally exposed and vulnerable. But at the same time, you have the supreme glory of God being shown in the cross. Both are there at the same time. And these are things that even the angels were told marveled at. And things that Satan himself could never quite conceive. In all of his wisdom, and all of his glory, he could not understand the cross. At the cross also we have More paradoxes. Thank you. <laughs> we have perfect justice. Perfect justice. Not one iota of, of uh, leniency when it comes to the law of God. Perfect justice, but we also see triumphant mercy. There's divine wrath. Absolute, poured out divine wrath. Not, God not withholding one ounce but also you see the agape, unconditional love of God. You see the immutable law not changing for one minute and also overwhelming grace. And you see the height of foolishness, and yet you also see absolute power. And we could go on and on and on. And the only way to truly understand and experience this is to draw close to the cross of Jesus Christ on a regular even daily basis. Lord, you need to help me understand this because it's too profound for me. It would do well if we would spend that hour that we're counseled to do in contemplation of the life of Jesus Christ and draw close to the cross. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians, we preach Christ crucified. That was his statement of saying this is the the ultimate message that matters for the people of Corinth. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block for the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. But to those who are being saved, both Jews and Greeks, it is the power of God and the wisdom of God, the preaching of Christ crucified. And then later on in chapter 2, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Understanding and experiencing the crucifixion of Christ is the beginning of all faith. Everything else of our faith has to fall under the umbrella of the meaning and reality of the cross. If not, then things get askew. Things become warped. Things become twisted. If we do not evaluate and keep the cross to the center of our faith, the cross is the central reality of our faith. Now, this is not to diminish our other uh, elements of faith that are so important, but they have to be seen in the central message of Scripture, which is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. There's a fascinating story in Adventist history um, that I want to share with you. In the 1870s, James White comes across a picture called The Way of Life. The Way of Life. And because he was a publisher and he was an evangelist, he was very excited to have any new tool or resource 
to help people understand the plan of salvation. Again, the mid-19th century, pe- many people still illiterate. They, the, the early church loved to use graphs and charts and images. You've seen the picture of the Daniel 2 statue and all the beasts and things like that. The evangelists and the, those working in those days, and we still obviously use lots of graphics and pictures today. So he was very excited to see this new presentation of the gospel. And so it's called uh, The Way of Life. And for about five years... He published this picture, and they sent it out to evangelists, and they sent it out to churches. Thousands upon thousands of this picture were created in, uh, in the mid-1870s. And this is one of those progressive pictures. It starts with creation up in this corner with the lightning and the darkness being spread and perfect Garden, Eden, Garden of Eden, and then Adam and Eve and their sin being expelled from paradise and Cain and Abel and to the sacrificial system. Here you have the law tree and the two tablets of the law presented. Jesus Christ to the right of that on the cross, the the Last Supper and baptism all the way moving up to the second coming and to the eternal kingdom of God. It's one of those progressive pictures, right? And so for many years, the Adventist church was embracing this, using it, valuing it, became a a, a, a relevant uh, uh, graphic to try to uh, illustrate the plan of salvation. But in 1860, excuse me, in 1880, uh, James White begins to have a change of heart. And he begins to feel that there's a problem with this picture. And so he writes to his wife, Ellen White, and he says, I'm working on a new picture. He called it Behold the Lamb. It it gets renamed. But he says, I'm working on a new picture. And I made some changes to the picture of the way of life. And I think that this picture will be better for us in our presentations. Now, sadly, he dies in 1881. So he never completes the picture. But in 1883, Ellen White and her sons, they pulled together his uh, resources. They pulled together what he'd had. And they complete the picture that James White had begun in editing and reimagining the way of life. You want to see that picture? Now, this is one of those comparisons. See if you can notice the difference. Ready? You notice anything different? This became the, and they renamed it too, Christ, the way of life. That became the name of this picture, Christ, the way of life. Now, I'm going to go back here for a second. You notice here, the cross is there, right? It's there. It's not like it wasn't there. But where does it play in this picture? It's right next to the law, both of them at the center, both presented right at the front, okay? And in addition to that, the portrait of Jesus, he's really no more significant or bigger than any of the other portraits. He's just another part of the story, an important part of the story. But he's portrayed as the cross and the Savior as just kind of the next chapter, and it's almost put on an equivalence with the law. The law is at the front, the cross is at the front, and they're both kind of put in parallel. The new picture, commissioned by Ellen White and her sons, removes the law tree altogether, and it becomes an unmistakable central reality to the Adventist picture of Christ, the way of life. And who is at the very front, and what image is at the very front of this picture? It is Jesus Christ on the cross. And those of you who know Adventist history, this opened up a whole new chapter of evaluating the role of the Savior within Adventist history. It's, just, it's right after now, the desire of ages and, and uh, thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, the story of redemption and uh, 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 steps to Christ. All of the messages that Ellen White would write on the centrality of the cross come after this time, after 1880 and after 1883. This was a significant time in our church when we found that it was necessary to put the cross in its proper place. This does not diminish the law. This does not diminish the realities of the the other teachings of the Bible. It just says that they cannot be understood unless the cross comes first. The cross must have its proper place. We must draw near to the cross to see every other truth in its proper light. Devoid of the reality and truth of the cross, every other element of our faith and of our life is not clearly discerned or seen. Faith matters. It's not just about the reality. There's so many things we could talk about when it comes to the cross, friends, and I don't mean to uh, dismiss them. If we had time, I could talk about all of the Old Testament uh, prophecies and all the scriptures pointing to the cross and and Daniel and and Psalm 22. By the way, you cannot understand the book of Job without uh, studying the cross. Everything in Job comes to make sense when you understand that Job is writing in the context of someone suffering in a similar way as the cross. 
Read Job 19. It just, everything comes together when you see it in the light of the cross. We could talk about the seven sayings of Christ on the cross, or the seven scars that he had because of the cross, or the seven trials, or the seven miracles, or the seven confessions of Jesus Christ at the time of the cross. And we could talk about everything else, of the atonement, and expiation, and propitiation, and, and sanctification, and justification, and redemption, and ransom. Oh, am I forgetting any? And judgment. All of those are relevant and real and wonderful things to contemplate. But we have to do that as we draw close in our hearts and our minds to Jesus Christ on a regular basis. Here's the thing, guys. You don't need to hear it from me. Go to your Bibles and let the Holy Spirit open your hearts and minds to who Jesus Christ is and what his sacrifice on the cross really, really means. Keep the cross at the center of your faith. Most of the debates and challenges that we have in our church and in in Christianity and theology are answered or at least addressed when we keep the cross at the center of our faith. Women's ordination, friends, is solved at the foot of the cross. Understanding the Sabbath and understanding uh, 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 prophecy, all is found at the foot of the cross when we see the Savior dying for our sins. It may not always be the black and white that we want, but we'll have the attitude, we'll have the spirit of Jesus Christ when we come to the foot of the cross. The doctrine of creation would never have allowed uh, elements of evolution to come in if we kept the cross central. Our values, our beliefs, how we decide our lives and our faith when we keep the cross central. It gives us the boundaries and clarity that we need to order our lives. Keep the cross at the center of your family, at the center of your relationships. If you're dating, if you're married, if you're having an argument, go to the cross and see how much that argument is really worth it. When you're developing friendships, how you organize yourself with the the church family and the church, how you even plan your finances. Let the cross show you what sacrificial living looks like. Keep the cross at the center of your future plans. We all have goals and dreams. What school will I go to? What job am I pursuing? What has God called me to? Uh, What ministry does he expect for me in the future? What about retirement? When to retire? What to do with my retirement? The cross is not a secondary consideration. It should be a primary reality to every element of our faith. Keep the cross at the center of your very soul. And you will not be led astray. God will always, always draw near to you. The hymn writer said, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my soul rolled away it was there by faith i received my sight and now i am happy all the day the cross will never leave you dry the cross will never leave you confused the cross is where you will meet Jesus Christ and you will know your Savior. Find Him. Find Him. We need it more than ever, friends. We need Jesus. Let the tension of the paradox of the cross stretch your soul. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I realize this is a a very limited and abbreviated approach to this monumental subject. But God, I don't think there's anything deeper in your heart or more profound in our heart that you want to teach us. 
Inspiration tells us that the science of salvation will be our study throughout eternity. We will continually marvel, even in the kingdom, when we are made new and standing in glory, we will continue to marvel and stand in awe of your sacrifice at the cross. May that happen now, Lord. Change us as we draw near. Humble us. Teach us, Father. May we be a people fully centered on accepting your plan, your forgiveness, your sacrifice, your power, and your glory that is found at the cross. Let it instruct our families. Let it instruct our faith. Let it instruct every element of our being. Thank you for being patient with us, Lord. Thank you for never leaving us or abandoning us. We love you today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. I hope that you have a wonderful day. I hope you can stay for our potluck. And then just a quick reminder, after potluck, we'll meet right here for the children's ministry meeting. God bless.